So um, I think it's time we start. Um, welcome everybody to this GTA free webinar. Um, this webinar belongs to this series of web free webinars we are doing uh, online. So everybody gets in the loop and nobody forgets what aviation is for. And today we're going to talk about jet orientation course. Uh, it's part two. Some of you may have attended to the first day who was two days ago given by David Aguinaco, who's a very, very nice GTA instructor. And uh, today we're going to continue getting into the details of this jet orientation course. Um, as you may know, this is like a um, soft introduction to the jet orientation course. If you decide to come to GTA or finally you perform your course in GTA, you'll get the full course. This is just a short briefing, like a short introduction of what the course is in, in reality. So let me introduce myself. My name is Francisco Espinosa. Some of you may know me already because some of you, you've been already in GTA. Uh, I've been GTA instructor for the last four years and a half and I have the chance to give instruction on ATR and A320. So it's, it's going to be a pleasure for me to show this uh, orientation course to all of you, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. If anytime you have a question, we have another colleague from GTA that are paying attention to the chat, but the main idea is to I go straight away for the presentation, and I will not stop, I mean, at the middle of the presentation, so just complete the full presentation, okay? Uh, it will take to me around 50 minutes to one hour to complete the presentation and at the end we may have time to solve some questions that you may write on the chat regarding the presentation. So I'm going to share my screen uh, with you guys so you can see my um, presentation, the gender orientation course part, part two. It's also, as you may know from Monday, it's of focused on the A320. So the minimum level required for this presentation to be understood or to take the most out of it is if you're a commercial pilot or IFR license. But this is not required at all. I mean, everybody can perform this course so you can just start understanding what an Airbus is or even if you're an Airbus pilot, you can understand more and more things about the aircraft, the aircraft because as you may know, this aircraft is very complex, it has very things on it, so we never stop learning on the Airbus. So that's why this course is focused for everybody who wants to attend to it. This is an introductory course to jet power aircraft based on the Airbus 320 and it is divided in five parts and nine sections. Okay, so keep in mind that on Monday we have the, the part one, Today we have the part two, but it's like a five part course and following parts will come in that week on in the following day. So pay attention to the GTA social networks or to the email if you are subscribed to the email listing. So keep online, stay tuned because more course will come. Each part takes around 50 minutes. It doesn't mean it will be exactly 50 minutes and probably on the Airbus, as you may know, it will be more than 50 minutes. And but this is like the, the idea, okay? We'll be moving around those 50 minutes and that's all. So let's go into the index, which is the most important part, okay? Today we are on that part, okay? Part two, and today we'll be covering the aircraft general of the Airbus 320 and also the auto flight system. Okay, the auto flight system is very, very complex. It's a very big system. So today we're going just to see like the basics of it. We're going to cover basic aspects or the best, the theoretical knowledge on how to do it. Remember that this orientation course is not only composed by ground training. It also has four full flight simulator sessions. And in those sessions is where you will learn to by the aircraft, you learn how to manage the inertia of a jet aircraft and how to manage automation. Because Airbus is almost based in automation, as you may see in the following slides. So let's go get into it in the aircraft general. So we all know what an Airbus 320 is. We are, we've seen it many times in the airports. We've traveled inside of them. So 
We all know the Citrine engine, subsonic, medium range aircraft. And the A320 is one of the most advanced single ale aircraft in service today with the fly-by-wire flight controls. This fly-by-wire flight controls is the thing that makes the aircraft that special because pilot-wise, when we fly the aircraft, it has nothing to do with another conventional aircraft we've made flown before or in the flight school or in other companies or the models. So this fly-by-wire is almost unique from Airbus and it's a very, very, very nice system that makes the aircraft easy to fly, it's very comfortable for the pilots, it's very comfortable for the passengers. So the aircraft itself, uh, we have three different plant type, okay? We have the Pratt & Whitney for the A318, and then we have CFM International and EIE International Aero Engines. Those two types of engines are fitted to the rest of the family for the A3, A19, A320 and A321. I don't have to remember to you that this is a common time rating. Once you get the Airbus type rating, you get all of them on your license. So now those small changes are based on the operator choice, um, depending on the engine that the company has chose for the aircraft or not. But the aircraft performance remains the same. The aircraft handling capabilities are almost the same, but the different engines are provided in order to give more flexibility to the companies or different type of uh, techniques or materials for the aircraft and for maintenance purposes. So in the, in the Airbus manuals or in the CBTs, which is the computer-based training programs, we always have those type of numbers, okay? Those are the basic weights of the aircraft, okay? And of course, you have to pay attention to that. If you know it, you know that it depends on the company. It depends on the operator, the weights of the aircraft. So those are like the basic ones, okay? Those are the limitations. All those numbers, you may find them on the FCOM of the aircraft, which is the flight crew operating manual of the aircraft inside of the limitations chapter, okay? So if you're flying in a company, you may have to go to your FCOM, to your limitations part, and check which are your specific weights for that day and for that aircraft, because not all the aircraft do have the same weights and not all the fleets or all the companies use the same weights for the aircraft. And those drawings we have below are very visual. It's like the range of the aircraft. It's like 2,900 nautical miles. Roughly, approximately, it will depend on payload, it will depend on many factors, but basically it's the, like the basis of the range of the aircraft. The passenger seating layout may vary depending on the operating requirements. Of course, I bet you've never seen one cabin like that. This is an old fashioned cabin. I can't remember one of those cabins, maybe in the 70s films. And well, it will depend also, as I told you, the weight of the aircraft depends on the operator. Of course, the inside, the layout of the cabin will depend also on the company. This is an old fashioned cabin. Uh, you see how big the seats are. It is no longer like that. Actually, today we use the thinner seats ever because they are lighter and they occupy less space. And we try to put a lot more people on the aircraft, which is uh, the goal of the companies, the profits of the flight. Okay, so the more people I put on the aircraft, the, the more profitable the flight is. So this seats capacity you see here in the box may vary depending not only on the aircraft, but also on the company. Those number there, for example, for the A321, which is the, the last one, says 226 for the A321. And this is the maximum capacity of the aircraft. So it doesn't mean every single A321 you see will have 220 seats. No, it will depend on the operator. You may see a 321s having just 200 seats or less. It will depend on the company, but this is the maximum. So it's like a raw number to see the maximum seats you can have on the different types. And this is the cockpit. This is the part where we are interested in, right? The cockpit is designed for two crew members and it also has place for two observers. So it means uh, there are two pilots 
and the hand can have two jump seaters, which are the jump seats, the additional seats we have in the cockpits, and so the four people in the cockpits. We all know the layout of the cockpit. It's basically the overhead panel on top. Then we have the glow shield. We're going to be paying attention to that one today. Instrument front panel, which where the screens are, screens where we are going to be paying attention during the flights. The press tongue with the thrust levers. And of course, the DO side sticks, which are used to fly the aircraft and are based on the fly-by-wire system. Let's have a look into the overhead panel. What's the overhead panel? By definition, overhead panel. The overhead panel is used during the pre-flights to check that all the lights are out. This is the dark cockpit philosophy, okay? For the people not being familiar with this dark cockpit philosophy, it means no light in the cockpit, everything goes fine. If I have a light in the cockpit, in the overhead, it means that something is not working as it should be or something is not working on the basis it's been designed for. So that's why the dark cockpit philosophy, it's very easy, it's very nice for pilots because with just with having a look into the overhead panel, if you see no lights, it means that everything goes normal, smooth, smooth right. And um, we use it for the pre-flight to check that all the lights are off and in flight to carry out emergency or abnormal procedures, okay? Just a quick break on that one. Uh, it is very important for you to know that normally no memory actions are carried on that one. So those emergency or abnormal procedures that are mentioned in the presentation are always carried out with a procedure in front of us. This is the ECAM, for example, or the QRH uh, procedure. So, Normally, we always follow a guideline, we follow a list, a procedure before touching any button. This is the aircraft philosophy. Then we have the glare shield. The glare shield is the panel we have just in front of us. If you sit it like a pilot and you just sit it normally, look forward, what you have is a glare shield. The glare shield is used for flight guidance, so it means the autopilot. And short-term management or MCDU for long-term management. We'll see this later on in the presentation. And control the electronic flight instruments, which is the famous EFIS. The EFIS is those small push buttons we have in there. And those are the controls we're going to be using. In any case, we, can, we want to change the information presented on our screens. As you may see, we have one for the copilot and another one for the captain. So it means this information selection is independent depending on who's choosing and who's touching the panel. The instrument panel, which is the front panel, which is the panel where we are looking at the most part of the flight, it's where we have the screens, roughly. So the flight information through the electronic flight instruments, EFIS, and the integrated standby instrument system, the ISIS. This is the ISIS, okay? This is more part there. This is the ISIS and it is fitted in, let's say, in modern aircraft because in previous versions of the Airbus, we didn't have this ISIS, we had the S standby instruments, okay? In the previous aircraft, we had the um, horizontal, horizontal there, and just an airspeed indicator, it was all analogic. It was, you know, from the basics of the aircraft, the source, the data stores for those instruments are from like a standby source in order to avoid mistakes on the primary sources. But in modern aircraft, they have modernized, let's use that word again, the system and now it's digital and the name is ISIS, Integrated Standby Instrument System, okay? System information through the electronic centralized aircraft monitoring, okay? That's the full name for our friends, the ECAM. Everybody knows the ECAM. ECAM is not only the procedures, because everybody remember ECAM actions, right? It's not only the, the procedures, the abnormal procedures, but it's also all the information contained on those two central screens, okay? So the ECAM is composed by two screens. It's commonly known as upper ECAM and lower ECAM, but the real name is the engine one in display for the top one, and it is used engine one in display for the top one. 
and the lower one it's known as system display because it's the page where we're going to be able to see the system the the synoptics of the systems and the use for that a small panel which is called ecom control panel which is just at the bottom of those two panels and we can see it later on no problem just a general idea that's the ecom but everybody knows the ecom for the abnormal procedures but it's not only for that is the page where we get the most information out of the aircraft in flight. So this is the pedestal, okay? The pedestal has many things, good? Uh, we start from the MCPUs. This name everybody knows, of course. And, but this is the acronym for the Multiple Pose Control Display Unit. Good, MCDU, everybody knows MCPUs. Then we have ECP, as I just told you in the previous slide, this is the ECAM control panel. This is a small panel that we use in order to get information out of the ECAM. For example, I can get the status of the pneumatic system just by pressing bleed, it's a bleed page. If I press bleed, the system will show me on the lower screen, remember system display, uh -huh. this will show me the bleed status, okay? Then we have the thrust levers, to set power on the aircraft and the radio panels. The radio panels are divided in two parts, right? You can have those two. Normally, I always to the I always go to the right part of it because it's my natural seat. I'm co-pilot, so I normally go to that part. So that's why. So it's divided in two parts. This is the RMP, which means radio management panel. And we also have then the ACP. ACP, which is the audio control panel. Good. We normally use the RMP to set frequencies on it, and we use the ACP to transmit on that frequencies. Okay. Both are linked together, and we need both in order to properly communicate with ATC or the company or whoever we are talking to. Then we have the speed brakes that are made to correct mistakes, not really but that's the reason everybody knows behind. And the flaps for landing, flaps lever there, okay? This is basically the layout of the pedestal. And those are our lovely side sticks, okay? Side stick is not composed only by the stick itself. It has three buttons. Um, it's not three buttons, but there are two buttons which has three functions, right? So we have the push to talk PB, which is the PTT, which is like, um, the, the thing we use for the trigger, like in a gun, the trigger, the thing we use for communicating. And this red button we have there, it has two functions, those two functions. The autopilot disconnect push button and the priority push button. You can see them in detail later on, but I can advance you that depending on the intensity, not the intensity, sorry, but the time you press the button, you'll get one option or the other, okay? the priority or the autopilot disconnection. Those are the main dimensions and of the aircraft with and without charlets, charlets, sorry. And this, it's a very important number to know for the pilots. Why? Because if you taxi in your aircraft and suddenly you see a mark on the ground that says maximum wingspan 30 meters, you know that you cannot get in with your A320. So it's very important you know, it's one of the limitations you may know the most, because actually you can have a problem if you taxi your aircraft into an area where it will not fit at all. So just for you to know, the Airbus 320 with Charlotte's is 35.8 meters wide, but if it has no charlotte it is 34.1 meters okay so those two numbers are essential once again remember 320 okay but as you may already know this aircraft depending on if it's the a319 21 20 it's the same okay the wingspan is the same the only thing that changes is the length of the aircraft okay but not getting too much in detail on that, not wasting too much time on the dim dimensions of the aircraft, pay attention to those two dimensions and that everything will be fine. We will not hit anything. And of course, when taxing your aircraft, respect the center line, 
because if you are on the center line of your taxiway, you'll never hit an obstacle outside the taxiway. Safety first, guys. So another thing that we, are, we normally see, it's the pressurized areas of the aircraft. Those are the unpressurized areas. It's good to know. For everybody asking what happens with my pet when I take it with me in flight, of course, the cargo is pressurized and it's not only pressurized, but it's also conditions. And for you to know, maybe some people here is pilot and it's commonly flying the aircraft. You may know that when we have an animal, a pet in the aircraft, the pilots are in front of it and we, we take care of him. We take care of it. Of course, we, we, we pay attention to the temperature in the cargo and we try to, ride, to make the ride smooth like like for the people right but it's like when we have an animal on the cargo it's like we are even 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 more careful the antennas of the aircraft is a very nice information to know this is some information you get more and more in detail as you are um getting deeper and deeper on the aircraft so it's it's good to know the antennas we have but it's not an essential information then what about the cargo? We just mentioned the cargo is pressurized. What happens with the cargo? How many cargo holds do we have on the aircraft? We have three. Let's say three cargos in the aircraft. There are two cargo compartments, big compartments, which is the aft and the forwards. And we also have the bulk, the bulkhead compartment, which is a separate small compartment for small packages or for small bags. For example, in my company, we use it for the last minute passengers. Remember, this passenger that has changed the ticket last minute, he gets into the aircraft two minutes before departure, but the bag will not fit into the cockpit. So they take the bag down and they put it in bulk. It's like a quick access, um, quick access hold, let's say that, right? And the door, it's easy to open or to close. So, well, it's nice information to know, but the, it says the cargo compartment can accommodate standard AKH containers. AKH is just the cargo containers we've seen, those silver containers, silver color containers we've seen outside of the aircraft. And this is where they put all the baggages in. They put the baggages in and then they lift it up with a high loader and then they put the cargo inside. And then we have a small rolls into the, the small like wheels small wheels in the, at the in the floor of the cargo compartment and they used to slide those akh to the end or to the position they should be it's very important guys for you to understand that imagine this is the cargo and imagine i can get three akh inside okay but it doesn't necessarily mean that when I get one AKH, AKH inside, it goes straight to the bottom or to the end. No, it will depend on the load, on the mass and balance of the aircraft, on the CG, center of gravity. Maybe this AKH goes just in the middle. But as I told you, <clears throat> this is just, uh, it will depend on each flight, the the amount of payload, but don't think that the AKH goes straight away to the end or just at the beginning. It will depend on each different flight. Good. This was for the general introduction of the aircraft. This is like the basics. This is complementing the first day, the Monday's presentation by my colleague David. And now we are going to get into the auto flight system. Auto flight system, guys, when I have people on my type ratings, when we go to the team, I always say that auto flight is 90% of your type rating. Why? Because this aircraft is based on automation. And if it's based on automation, it means that I have to understand what the aircraft is doing. And not only understanding the aircraft, but flying or managing the aircraft in such a way that it will lead me to a safe flight or it will take me to the place where I'm going to, going to be. I mean, it's not permissible that the aircraft flies me. Let's accept me that expression. You have to fly the aircraft. It's not the aircraft flying you. So in order to do so, you need to know understand and manage and master your auto flight system so this 
out of flight system or this management of the automation in the Airbus is one of the most important parts during any Airbus training. And this is where we waste, let's say waste, understand me, the most part of the time during the sessions. So for the people coming from conventional aircraft, understanding that, is, that this is a highly automated aircraft and we need to pay attention to the automation, okay? It is good, it is one of the golden rules if things don't go as expected to take action and many people think that this means to disconnect the autopilot. But disconnecting the autopilot, even if it's always an option, it's always good just not to reach that point. So if I understand what my aircraft doing, if I understand what I want to do with the aircraft, I won't be needing to disconnect the autopilot. So <clears throat> let's go get into it. Uh, we have the section five, which is the A320 auto flight system. For the auto flight system in the A320 family, computation and processing are done by two flight management guidance computers. So we start getting numbers retaining figures in my, in my mind and I have two FMGCs, you see, one and two at the bottom, two FMGCs. The two FMGCs are identical and this is capital and this is based on the Airbus philosophy. Those two FMGCs are identical and normally work together. We will group them as Fly Management and Guidance System, which stands for FMGS. So I have two FMGCs, identical, and let's say co-working, working together, but the entire group they perform, I mean, the both FMGCs, it is called FMGS. And it is in charge of computation and processing. Good. Now we start thinking, okay, FMGS. What's that for? What's going on with that? Easy, <clears throat> sorry. FNGS receives information. Which kind of information? Navigation information, which I advance you, this is set by pilot. Sorry for the letter, but for the pilot talking through the NCDU. Then aircraft performance information. Once again, performance means, <clears throat> sorry again, <laughs> weight or speed or cost index for fuel consumption or relationship between speed and consumption. Then we have the air data and inertial reference system, ADIRS, and the global positioning system for position and dynamic information. So now you get that the, actually the FMGS or the FMGC is getting inputs from many things. It's getting the route, it's getting the performance, it's getting the, from the GPS and the IDRS the air data information. So it means that it gets a lot of inputs. And then additionally, of course, the clock, which is always nice to know, time at which it is, and the radio navigates. But not only automatic, as I told you, we get the air data information for the ideas or for the um, GPS or for the clock, which is actually a satellite clock, it's an atomic clock. But as I told you, we gave information on the previous slide, those two initial parts, those two there, navigation information and aircraft performance information, are provided by the pilots. Then, how do I talk to the aircraft? I use the MCDUs, multiple post control and display units, MCDUs. So, through the MCDU, I'm telling to the FMGS, what do I want? Okay, I want to fly from A to B in that SID using that route and then using that star and this approach to that runway. And then additionally, we also use the performance pages in order to get the aircraft informed of my weight, my desired speed, my cruising level. Okay, so all these we use it through the MCDU. And as you may see in the presentation, it's for long-term interventions, okay? So it's for uh, data or for numbers or actions I would perform long-term. For example, imagine it's a 12-hour flight. So I tell the aircraft now that in 12 hours, I'll be performing that standard arrival. So this, that, that's why it's called 
long-term interventions. Those actions will last during the flight, even if we can change them. It doesn't mean that something I put on the MCDO is unchangeable, not at all. It means that are designed for long term. And then we also have this FCU. FCU is flight control unit, which is roughly or commonly known as, let's say, the autopilot panel, right? It's the autopilot control panel. It's the panel I use for telling the aircraft, okay, I told you that cruising speed is 0.78, long term. But for some reason, ATC constraints or wherever, I want you to fly now 0 0.80. But it's not going to be in a long-term basis. It's just, for example, for five minutes or for 10 minutes because ATC told me, please accelerate the aircraft in order to get separation with another one. Good. So as it is a shown term, what I use, I use my FCU, I use my autopilot to tell to the aircraft, okay, I know, I told you 0.78. Sorry for that. But now I need 0.80. So that's why it's very important to understand that the philosophy of the aircraft is long-term actions for the MCDU and short-term actions for the autopilot. Okay? So now let us continue with that. We've seen all the inputs that actually the MCDUs or the FMGS, to properly speaking, uh, are receiving air data, route, performance, clock, radio navigations, good. But what about the output? The outputs, of course, we've got outputs, right. For example, the flight directors and the autopilots for pitch, roll, and your control, auto thrust. And of course, this is one of the most visual ones, let's say, the MCDUs and the EFIs for the display of information, okay. Now the FMGS got my information. Okay, I told him, I want to fly from that point to that one using that route. So I use my MCDU for a long-term action. So I told the FMGC what to do. And now the input of the, of the FMGS is to show me on my screen, on my EFIS, the route I've selected. So this is like an output, right? The autopilot is also an output because I told the aircraft I want to cruise at 35,000 feet. Okay, I selected it on my MCDU. So I gave him an input. But what about the output? The output is that he will automatically cruise at 35,000 feet. Of course, remember, I told you, this can be changed. It doesn't mean it's a, a reversible action. No, if I'm cruising 350 on the ground, but then ATC, uh, tells me, oh no, 350 is occupied. You may choose another different level. Okay, in that case, I'll choose 340. So you can change, not only as a short-term action on the FCU, but the proper action, it will be to change the MCDU to set 340 as a long-term action. So it will remain there for the remainder of the flight, unless we change it again. Okay, and then, there are many outputs. Another one, the last one is the navigation. Of course, the aircraft is constantly tuning different radios. It's the auto tuning system because he's selecting VORs constantly in order to get the position updated. Even if we have IRS or GPS, it uses those VORs to make the position calculation and computation more accurate. So that's why it's another of the outputs of the FMGS. Because I can actually see which VOR it's been automatically tuned by the aircraft. Then, FMGS, we've seen that it's composed by two FMGCs. Good. But those two FMGCs has different functions. Those functions we just, just saw in the previous slides. So, now we can summarize and say that the FMGS is divided into three main parts. Flight management flight guidance, and flight augmentation. Good. What about that? Flight management. What's flight management? This means for navigation, the route, flight planning, the fuel, the alternate fuel, the contingency fuel, wherever. Performance optimization, optimization, sorry. Optimum cruise level. Sorry, optimum flight cruise level, or optimum speed economic climb, economic descent, whatever. Predictions, oh, this is the most important. 
which is my estimated time of arrival. This is the last flight of the day. What time is the time I'll be arriving at the airport and go home? Then predictions, not only for the fuel, no, sorry, for the time, but also for the fuel. It's telling you how much fuel you're gonna have on arrival or which is going to be your minimum fuel for diversion to the alternate airport in case you're holding, in case wherever. And display management in order to show you on the screen, as you see, display management, the control of information to the EFI system to display auto flight modes and navigation information. Auto flight modes, this is our friend FMA, which is the flight mode annunciator. And the flight mode annunciator, um, just to clarify what is said that, is the upper part of the screen we have in front of us. And it's showing to me which, sorry for the letter, for the writing again, is showing me which kind of autopilot modes are engaged at each state of the aircraft. So it's very good to understand that also, but I told you it belongs to the automation understanding I mentioned on the first slide of the auto flight system. Then, oh, flight guidance. What's flight guidance? Autopilot commands, flight director commands, and auto throttle, auto thrust commands, okay? So what's that? It's basically, let's say this can be achieved by the short term actions, right? For example, the actions I get through my FCU, this is the flight guidance. So flight management is more, let's say, just to summarize, um, to make it simple, it's just to summarize out the actions I'm using on my MCDU, long-term actions, flight management, the route, the cruising, performance, whatever. And then this um, flight guidance part, even if it can be related to MCDU long-term actions, are more related to the autopilot, right? This autopilot commands, for example, if you're flying in NAV, heading, wherever, flight director commands, these two, I will link them because the autopilot will be commanding the flight director. It means the other way around. Flight director will obey to the autopilot input. So if I set a heading on the FCU, the autopilot will set that heading and the flight director will be showing me what to do in order to fly to that heading. So those two are linked together. And the auto throttle command, auto thrust command, sorry, it's also linked to that because if I tell to the autopilot to accelerate the aircraft, then he will send a signal to the auto thrust computer in order to accelerate the aircraft. And then this is the flight augmentation. The flight augmentation is achieved by the FAC, which is a very unknown system, it's a very unknown computer. And, but we have two on the Airbus 320. And the flight augmentation computers is in charge of all of that. Flight envelope computation, maneuvering speed computation, for example, F speed, S speed, green dot speed, wherever. Wind shear detection, achieved by also the predictive wind shear system or the reactive wind shear system. And then the alpha 4 protection. Alpha 4 protection is one of the nicest things we have on the aircraft. Why? Because regarding that the aircraft have different control laws, if we're flying everything normal, no abnormal procedures, no abnormal anything, no failures, um, it will be literally impossible to stall that aircraft. Because if you try to stall the aircraft, sometimes it's scary to say that, but the aircraft takes control and she doesn't allow you to um, stall the aircraft. It has an alpha flow protection. It means that actually if you are stalling or if you're trying to stall the aircraft, the aircraft will nose down and set power and take you out of that situation. So it's lovely, lovely function we have. And this function is achieved by the flight augmentation computer. It's not a separate function, it is actually, but it belongs to the flight envelope computation, okay? Because flight envelope computation, uh, it computes speeds as VLS. You know VLS stands for lower, lowest selectable speed. So it's the lowest speed I can select for the aircraft to fly. At a given point, even if I choose zero knots or in order the aircraft to fly zero, she will never fly zero. She will always fly VLS, which is also linked to the alpha flow protection, okay? 
So, um, as a general rule, the two FMGCs are um, have sensors and they exchange information for validity. Okay, you see the information goes to both of them, and then we have two FMGCs and they talk together by a cross talk bus. Simple as that. Good. Then it means that through this cross talk bus, what I set on the MCDU1, which is linked to FMGC1 will be automatically set to MCEDU2 and FMGC2, okay? So it's that simple. They are, um, basically they are linked together and they will communicate with each other. So the inputs from the M MCDU, sorry, from the FCU are fed to both FMGCs. So it's basically just for you to know that what I said on the FCU, which is short term, remember short, they will have an impact on the FMGC. For example, if I change my speed from 878 to 80, good. What happens actually is just uh, the aircraft will compute, the flight management patch will compute the new time of arrival and of course will compute the new fuel at destination. So it's always, always, always connected to get information. Then one important part of that, this is important. MCDU1 goes to FMGC1, which is normally linked to Flight Director 1 or to Pilot 1. And the same happens with those two, uh, the number two system. Amongst other things, this determines which autothrust channel is operative because we have two channels of the autothrust, and depending on which FMGC is connected, it will give you the appropriate autothrust channel also. So once again, this is the FCU, the one I use for the autopilot. And the most important thing, it has two channels. Airbus is designed on the backup principle. And it means that actually one system always have a backup. In the fa this is like the fail safe procedure. It means if my system fails, the other one will take over. And in the particular case for the FCU, which is the flight control unit, it, there are two identical computers. So if my Fly com sorry, my FCU one fail, it means that the FCU two will take over with the same functions and the same capabilities. Okay, this is how the FCU is divided. Okay, this is for the speed and Mac, that part here. Okay, this is for the heading or this can be used for heading, track, navigation, lateral navigation, which is GPS. Um, those are the autopilot and the auto thrust connection and disconnection push buttons. And this is the vertical part, altitude and climb or descend modes. Good. Then how is the aircraft designed? Okay, as you may see, we have those knobs there. We have four knobs. And as a general rule, uh, those push buttons, not the general rule, but this is the design of the aircraft, those push buttons, those buttons has two options. It can be pushed or it can be pulled, okay? So depending on if I push or I pull, it has different name, but it has also different effects, okay? If I go straight away for pushing, if I push any of those knobs, it will mean manage. Manage means automatic. If I push, sorry, I push is manage, managed. And then this manage, it is programmed through the MCDU. So for example, if I manage, if I press the speed, so the aircraft takes control of the speed, it will go to manage speed. To which speed? To the speed I selected on my MCDU, economic speed, long range cruise, wherever, but it goes straight away to the automatic. <clears throat> this happens also with the heading. If I press the heading, I'll get NAV. Once again, it will be the routine selected on the MCDU. And also the altitude. The altitude, if I press it, it will be um, automatic climb mode. Those things are seen more in detail during the course, during the presential course in GTA, okay? but if I press it, it will be managed, it will be automatic. If I pull it, it will be 
not automatic, not, not manual, but less automatic than that one, okay? You'll see that in detail during type ratings or jet orientation courses. But basically, the idea is if I push, it goes automatic to the MCDU, but if I pull, pull, I take it to me, that's the general rule, right? If I pull, it's like I take control, it goes to me, I have control of it. So if I pull the speed, for example, I be able to select any number, and this is not a long-term action, this is not based on the MCDU, this is a short-term action based on my decision. I decide not to fly economic speed, I decide to fly 300 knots, like on the example. So for that, I have to pull and then select the number I want. And then you get turn and pull, wherever it is, basically pull in to get control, and it is selected guidance. Selected guidance on the aircraft is associated with blue colors. So if I pull 300 knots, it will be 300 knots, and this triangle there will be blue because it's selected by the pilot. Otherwise, if it's automatic, if I press it, it will relate it to magenta colors, okay? This is more the layout of it. The bird, this is something you will see in detail during the course, okay? And then the vertical area, we've seen the lateral part, which is divided in two parts for the speed and for the lateral navigation. And then we also have the vertical part divided in two parts. The altitude, which is the altitude I'll be flying, cruising, or wherever. And also this vertical speed flight path angle, which is actually in order to descend. This manual mode, there's no manage mode on that one, okay? There's no manage. If I push, if you see push to level off, it means if I push the button, the aircraft will just level off, will go to vertical speed zero. So this, the only, knob which has no manage mode okay if I just press it it will push to level off and that's all so in order to get a vertical speed or a flight path angle which is related to the bird okay this flight path angle is related to the bird as I told you this is something you'll see more in detail because it's not easy to explain and it's something you have to see um, if I pull to set a vertical speed, I'll be able to set wherever vertical speed is. For example, minus 1500, and it's also in feet per minute, okay? This vertical mode is very dangerous because it has top priority on the aircraft. So the aircraft will fly minus 1500 feet per minute regardless of the speed, regardless of the configuration of the aircraft. So. It's very dangerous to use this vertical speed setting, it has to be used with caution because it has top priority. Then the lock push button, which is used to track localizers, good. And then the approach push button. The difference between the lock and the approach push button, this will be lock only, lock only. And this will be lock and glide slope, okay? So in order to fly an ILS, we need to press that one. In order to fly a lock approach, we need to press that one, okay? This button is not only used for ILSs, but it's also used for non-precision approaches flown on the principle of final APP. Final APP is a very nice function we have on the aircraft to fly non-precision approaches as ILSs. This is to be seen more in detail during the course. Then we have the autopilot one and autopilot two push buttons. As I told you, as a general rule, we connect the autopilot of the pilot who's flying. If co-pilot is flying, we go for autopilot two. And if co-captain is flying, autopilot number one. But as you may see, there is only one push button for the auto thrust, but it also has two channels. But it's only one push button. Then this expedite push button is used as the name says expediting. So expediting means that in order to climb, it will go to green dot speed or in order to descend, it will go to 340 knots. This one is also to be used with caution, but this is the function, okay? And when selected, the green lights come on on the push button. So this light will come on, on expedite. And on the flight mode annunciator, we'll get expedite, climb, or descend, depending on the mode. Once again, we know short-term, 
long-term actions. Understood. Just for the people who doesn't know, who don't know what the FMA is, this is the flight mode annunciator. Okay, you see the autopilot modes that are set at each state of the flight. And those FMA inputs are given by the autopilot. So the selections I give on the autopilot are directly reflected on the FMA. This is the FMA. Thrust, altitude, this is for the lateral. In that case, the aircraft is flying a heading. You see the difference between the green and the blue colors. The blue colors means that are actually armed. It means I expect the aircraft to intercept, for example, this lock as soon as it has a strong signal. But actually, the aircraft is flying on the heading. Why? Because the upper green modes are the active modes of the aircraft. And then the fourth and the fifth column is information. This is the landing capability and the minimums of the approach. And AP1 plus 2, Flight Director 1, 2, and Auto Thrust is actually to see if these automation controls are engaged or not. FMA, active modes. And the blue ones are the arm modes. Once this glide slope or localizer becomes active, it will go straight up and it will be, instead of blue, it will be green, okay? As you see in those ones. Good. What about those two messages, for example? Those messages on the FMA. On the FMA, uh, those messages are related to information to the pilot. This is, for example, decelerate when you overflow the top of descent and you didn't start your descent. And more drag is when the aircraft is computing that you will not comply with an altitude constraint if you don't select the speed brakes out, okay? Those messages appear on the FMA, but they also appear on the, um, on the MCDU, okay? The items, when they become active on the FMA, it, they are boxed for a few seconds. Actually, they are boxed for nine seconds on the FMA, and then it will change from the box to the solid speed, no box um, status of the aircraft. Good, so this is basically the autopilot. This is basically the glare shield. The, remember, FCU, and those are the EFIS control panel, okay? In order to set my, um, my information on my screens. So how do I connect or disconnect the autopilot? Okay, there are, <clears throat> let's say like few legal ways, to, when I say legal, correct, proper, whatever you wanna say, ways to disconnect the autopilot. Turning the autopilot off will cause the master warning and the continuous repetitive chime, not sorry, the, sorry, it will be the recovery charge. So it tickety, tickety, tickety. And it will say that, okay, autopilot has been disconnected. Now you have control of the aircraft, okay? As you see in that fifth column, AP1 or two disappears, and now you fly manually. If you properly disconnect the autopilot, you'll get this AP off on the right part of the ECAM. And you say, how do I properly disconnect the autopilot? Just by setting this push button, clicking it once, and then you get the autopilot disconnected. Tickety, tickety, tickety. So it means you are manually flying. If you do it properly, you get this message there. But the autopilot can also be disconnected in several different ways, just by for example, pressing the push button on the FCU, which is not the proper way, just by applying sufficient force to the side stick or sufficient force to the pedals. In that case, you get the, the warning and you get autopilot not on the right part of the ECAM, that will be autopilot off here, but you get it on the left part because the aircraft doesn't know if it's a failure or if it's a common disconnection, right? What it means that it tells you, I don't know if the aircraft is being disconnected because it, the, the computer has failed or if the, um, for example, you disconnected it by mistake. So that's why it shows you on the left part of it. And you get continuous, continuous repetitive cavalry charge. If you do it with the push button, it will be only once, but if you do it with, another of the other means, it will be continuous repetitive cavalry charge. 
okay? Then the flight directors, as I told you, what you set on the autopilot, you'll get on the flight director commands. The status of the flight director is shown of the fifth column of the, of the FMA. And one flight director two is the common, is the standard, let's say, normal operation. It means, it means the flight director one is working, and the flight director two is working. If there's any mistake, any failure on the, sorry, on the flight director, it will be showing one. For example, if flight director two fails, it will be showing one flight director one, which means that both screens are showing flight director one information. It can also be to flight director two, showing that both screens are based on flight director two. This is also an indication of a FMGC failures, okay, to, see, to be seen later on. So, to select the flight director on, we use those push buttons on the EFIS control panel, and this is the different layout of it. So, one flight director two is both flight directors engaged normally working, one flight director, um, and then this small line means that flight director one is only engaged, then the other one. One flight director flight one has failed, and two flight director two when flight director one has failed. Easy. Good. Good. That is the bird. We're going above the bird because this is uh, to be seen during the course. Okay. So this is the auto thrust. Auto thrust is a very nice system, and in the auto thrust we have different modes. Okay. Uh, the auto thrust can work in two different modes. It can work in speed modes, which means that the auto thrust continuously adjusts the thrust in order to maintain a target speed or a Mach. And then we have thrust mode, when the auto thrust sets a given thrust. For example, this is associated to climb or descend modes, when actually the aircraft selects full climb available power or it selects idle power. So the auto thrust modes are automatically linked to the autopilot flight director modes. As I told you before, autopilot, flight director, and auto thrust are totally, totally linked one with the other. And it will be adapted accordingly. So when the autopilot flight direct, flight director vertical modes shows a trajectory, so for example, altitude hold, vertical speed, ground, glide slope, the auto thrust is in speed mode. Why? Because as we saw in the previous slide, the aircraft is continuously changing the power to be adapting it for a, for, a, um, for a given speed. But in case that the aircraft has to keep a target, or for example, like they say in point number two, when the autopilot fly direct or vertical mode adjusts the aircraft pitch in order to keep a target speed, which is climb or descent, then the auto thrust is in the thrust mode, which will be, for example, for climbing, will be thrust climb and this will be shown on the first column on the FMA. Okay, those are the thrust levers. It has different detents. Detents means where this where the levers will stop. Okay, if you put the levers on climb, for example, it has like a clutch and then you put the levers there and they'll stay there. And it means that the aircraft has control of it. How many detents do we have? We have Idle detent, climb, flex, MCT, toga, and then additionally we have the full reverse detent. Idle reverse is not a detent on the Airbus 320. Good. As you may see, this is the reverse. Reverse can be set in two different parts. Can be set to idle reverse or full reverse. Only full reverse is a detent. Idle is not a detent. Good. As soon as we have levers on climb, this TLP, which is thrust lever position, is like a donut. It will be shown on the engine warning display, and it will be showing not the actual power of the aircraft, because the actual power of the aircraft is given by that needle, but it shows where the levers are. So once you set them in climb, it will be always there. Good. So pay attention to that. It's not the actual power of the aircraft, but it is the actual position of the lever. It's a different thing. Remember that in Airbus, those levers don't move at all during flight. So 
it can happen that the engines are actually idle, but the levers are always in climb position, not in idle position. This is one of the things of the design of the aircraft. Good. So this is the active range of the auto thrust. So it means as long as the levers are in that range, so it goes between idle to toga, the auto thrust will be in arm, active mode, but if it's below that, it won't be working. It can be also off anytime, okay? There is a lovely slide, which is that one, okay, which shows the modes, the working modes of the auto thrust depending on the phase of it and depending on if we are two engines or one engine, okay? So for example, the red part, the left part means that auto thrust will be active one engine out between idle and MCTD tent. But for example, if you work in two engines, this auto thrust will be working only between idle and climb. So it means if you go to flex MCT, it can be armed or not active. Let's say manual thrust. So this is a very nice picture we have on that presentation regarding when and where is the auto thrust active. Good. In order to disconnect the auto thrust, as we've seen for the autopilot, we have different ways to disconnect the auto thrust. We have like, let's say again, two legal or two proper ways and one bad way. The proper ways are by depressing those small red buttons we have on the thrust levers. And before doing that, it is essential to match the TLP, which is the thrust lever position, with the actual setting of thrust of the aircraft. Why? Because if I disconnect my auto thrust with my TLP in a different position, once the auto thrust is disconnected, he says, okay, I give you control, manual control of the auto thrust. Then I'll match the actual thrust of the engine with the TLP, and then the aircraft will accelerate. So in order to avoid for that, we just match TLP with the actual thrust of the aircraft, and then we disconnect the auto thrust. Just by pressing one of those, one of those two disconnection push buttons. We can also disconnect the auto thrust by setting the push button to off, but actually it will be an illegal way. And as per the autopilot, sorry, as per the autopilot, you'll get this warning instead of getting it on the right part, which will be the legal one, you'll get here as a failure because the aircraft says, okay, I don't know if this has failed because of failure of the aircraft or why. But all I can tell you is that I have no more auto thrust. So that's why. So the legal way to disconnect, it will be just by pressing the instinctive disconnection push buttons on the thrust levers. But also, we also use to go idle. If you take the levers back to idle, it will disconnect. This is the most common disconnection uh, of the auto thrust in the Airbus because it's the one we use for flaring the aircraft. So we use the auto thrust down to the runway and just flaring the aircraft, we idle it, we go to idle and then auto thrust disconnects automatically. Good, this is the position computation. Those things are to be seen more in detail during the course. Okay, this is how the aircraft computes the position. Remember I told you about GPSs and uh, IRS position and so on. And of course, auto tuning of the nav aids. This is always used to position the aircraft properly in the position where it is avoiding position mistakes, thus having navigation errors, which are very bad to have. Okay, it computes the position. This is to be seen more in detail during the Airbus course. Okay, good. Let's go to the flight guidance. Again, autopilot, flight director, auto thrust are all integrated in the flight guidance. Remember one of the three parts belonging to the flight management guidance system. They operate in various modes so as to guide the aircraft to associated targets such as speed, heading, glide slope, FMS lateral flight plan. So once again, that's what I told you. Those are the parts that you are going to be mastering during your type rating or jet orientation course at GTA because it's 90% of the flight. To understand the FMA, 
and to understand what to do on the flight control, flight control unit, FCU, in order to get the aircraft where I want to fly. So once again, remember, we've seen that it is thrust climb related to auto thrust. This is climb, which is a vertical mode, navigation for lateral modes. So in that case, as you can imagine, lateral and vertical part of the flight uh, guidance thing is belongs to the same part. So it works all together to take my airplane where I want to be. So you see the climb is for climbing and nav is for navigating. It's self-explanatory. So I use climb for the vertical part, things I've set on my MCDU as long-term basis. Then once again, we have the different modes for climb or descending. You see these blue or magenta arrows here. This represents if it's managed or selected guidance. As you can see on the vertical speed, there is only one blue arrow meaning that there is no managed mode like we discussed before and of course in the altitude we have open climb or managed climb so if i press and i push it it will be what they say in the point number two which is climb or descend managed mode this is based on um let's say on mcdu let's say if i've selected um the economic climb or economic descent, the aircraft will adjust the speed at the flight's path in order to follow this economic speed. So in that case, the auto thrust will remain in THR mode. So it means that it will be always climbing or descending with maximum or minimum power available for climb. And then we also have the open climb and open descent, which is achieved just by pulling the altitude knob. The only thing that open climb and open descent mode has is a very bad thing. If we have constraints in the route, it means altitude to complain. Don't cross that point more than 1500, sorry, flight level 150. This restriction will be complied by the aircraft automatically only if flying in climb descent manage mode. If for some reason I decide to do it uh, manually or uh, like we have into those brackets. We are not flying in managed lateral mode. It means not enough but heading. I won't be able to set it managed. So I will be using open. So just to summarize, heading cannot have managed modes. So if I have no managed modes, there's no constraints compliant by the aircraft. So it's always good you pay attention to those details because this can lead to mistakes and it's important not to make mistakes when flying. You see, this is open climb on the FMA. Okay, let's go for it. And of course, we have these magenta things. These magenta things are the constraints. So in that case, you see it's on the right image. We have 6,000 feet magenta. So it means it's clearly showing that actually it says climb in green and trans climb. So it means we are climbing in manage, manage, because it's not open climb, it's just climb. So uh, in that case, you say, okay, you are climbing in manage mode, and then we have alt magenta. Alt magenta means that once the aircraft hits 6,000 feet, it will automatically level off to maintain 6,000 feet because this is a constraint. In case we have no constraint, no restriction on any departure or any arrival, what we have is the left image. We have climb in green, which means the vertical managed climb mode, but we also have Alt in blue. Alt in blue, as it's blue, it's selected by the pilot, like I told you before, on the end's FCU. And it means that the aircraft will continuously climb to flight level 240. Once we reach flight level 140, 240, sorry, the aircraft will level off and it will maintain 240. The difference is that actually, even if here we have 6,000 feet magenta, which means a constraint, on my FCU, I can have flight level 240. So even if I have manually selected flight level 240, 
if there is a constraint like that one, he will not respect my selection, but he will respect the constraint selection. So even if I've selected 240, he says, okay, I like to set 240, but actually there's a 6,000 feet constraint over that point. I'm going to respect that one. And then he will level off. That's the difference between uh, magenta and blue modes regarding the climb. And it will happen exactly the same for the open climb and open descent modes, okay? You see, again, descent stands for managed descent, MCDU, economic or automatic descent. But look, what I just explained to you, I've set 3,000 feet on the autopilot, but there is a constraint of flight level 40 in that case. So what the aircraft will do, it, it will reach 4,000 feet and then he will level off regardless of my position on the FCU. Please pay attention that those constraints, this function will be only available if we are using managed descent or managed climb. It means that I have pushed this knob in and I have selected, of course, something on my MCDU, but I assume this is done from before, okay? If I'm using open, my friends, it means that actually I won't be respecting any constraint and pay attention that if you have to maintain 4,000 feet and you continue going down to 3,000 feet, this is an altitude bust and we may have problems, okay? But this Climb and descend manage modes are very nice to know that they respect the constraints, but it's only linked to nav mode. Of course, if the aircraft is flying on the heading, he's not able to know which constraints to follow. So if for some reason you fly in the headings, ATC give you a radar vector, you won't be able to get manage climb or manage descend. So in that case, you'll be using this an actual reversion of the autopilot that goes to heading and vertical speed, which are the basic modes of the autopilot. After this reversion, we'll get a triple click in the cockpit, click, 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 saying that actually something has changed on my FMA and we have to change, um, or we have to check, sorry, the selection of the autopilot, okay? All cruise is an altitude, it's a vertical mode that is when we reach our cruise level set on the MCDU. Once we hit that cruise level, it will change to all cruise. It means that all the predictions for timing and fuel are based on cruising speed. This is essential because in case we have selected a different flight level here, instead of getting all cruise, I'll be getting alt. An ALT means that the aircraft is constantly waiting to climb and the computations for time and fuel will not be the same because the power setting and the engines will be different also. And now we're just going to see just an overview of the failures we have with the autopilot. For example, FCU 1 and 2 fold, which actually, this is the two channels of the autopilot. Good, it says that actually, I won't be able to select anything on my autopilot. Why? Because all this will be inoperative. So all FCU controls are inoperative. And look at the second point. Autothrust, both autopilots, both flight directors are not available except in land or go around mode where only the autothrust is lost. This is a protection of the aircraft because as you may see, landing and go around are two critical phases. Good? So pay attention that in case we have FCU two faults, not only we've lost the selections of the autopilot, but as we've lost, as you can see, the EFIS control panel, we also lost the Q&H selection and all the references of the aircraft, as you can see in the blue line, it says PFD, so primary flight display, which is the screen I have just in front of me, are related to standard only. So pay attention to low QNHs. Remember from high to low, look at below for the real altitude. So pay attention to the altitudes 
if you're flying in log QNHs, because all the references, all the altitudes you have on your PFD will be related to uh, standard only, 1013. Then what happens with the FAC? Remember, flight augmentation computer, the one in charge of the flight envelope, the speed computations, characteristic speed computation, wind shear, and so on. So depending on when the failure occurs, the rudder travel limiter system may not be in the correct position for the flight speed. So therefore, to prevent damage to the aircraft structure, they use the rudder with care when the speed is above 160. Remember that if you deflect a flight surface excessively at a high speed, you may damage the surface and it can be lead to fatal consequences. At the slats extension, full rudder travel authority is recovered. Of course, we are low speed in that case. And then with pack one and two in operative, the rudder travel system, rudder train control, yaw damper, and primary flight display characteristic speeds are lost. Remember that all the maneuvering speed characteristic speeds, which are flaps, slats, tension, and green dot speeds, those speeds are lost because the aircraft is unable to calculate the envelope. Remember that um, the fly augmentation computer is designed to compute the uh, envelope of the aircraft. Okay, so in the status page reminds you to use flap tree for configuration for landing and apply the landing distance procedure on the QRH. Remember I told you at the beginning, we don't do any procedure by memory. There's only eight memory items on the Airbus. The rest of procedures are done according to an electronic checklist on the ECOM or paper checklist on the QRH. Then this is a note very important. It's an extent, it's an advanced knowledge of the aircraft, but when extending the landing gear, you will revert from alternate to direct law. So it means the flying handling, the characteristics of flying the aircraft may change just a little bit before that. Then what happens if I lose all my FMGCs? Oh man, I lost, I lost my flight guidance, I lost my flight management part, I lost everything. So it says when the FM software cannot work properly or receive its instructions to perform impossible operations, it automatically resets itself. Average synchronization with the other FMS always follows. So if one FMS is lost, it tries to synchronize himself with the other one. And when the reset is a minor one, the system recovers by itself. One single reset lasts two to three seconds maximum, followed by a 25 seconds resynchronization. Imagine that one FMGS has totally lost the memory and now it has to recover everything. So the test, sorry, the reset takes two, three seconds, but the resynchronization takes 25 seconds. When the reset is a major one, reset recall at short intervals, several in two, three minutes, and the memories are clear. This is very important. Leading to the loss of flight plan, gross weight, cross index, cross cruise flight level, or MCDU enter the speeds and navigate and trip and database. So uh, if we lost both FMGS, we actually lose our screens and we have to fly with a system which is called navigation backup, NAV backup. Let's say that actually the aircraft has a short memory on it and it keeps small parts of the flight plan in good enough to allow me to fly the aircraft. Allow me to fly the aircraft in a short term while I try to reset the system. On the QRH, which is, this is taken from the QRH, we have a list for the FMGC that is actually helping me to reset the FMGCs. FMGC reset dual loss. On rare occasions, because actually it's a rare failure, the FMGC may require manual resetting. If this occurs in flight, reset only one FMGC at a time, okay? If I only lost one FMGC, try to keep the other one so we can fly the aircraft. If we've lost both FMGCs, we have to try to recover at least one. But during this time, remember, I have this NAV backup function, okay? It says that in the QRH, it is available a computer reset for both in flight or in ground, because can this can happen to you on the ground, but it can also happen to you in flight. Good. This is the yaw damper system failure. 
okay? Not very important, but actually now loss of autothrust channel one. Autothrust has two channels, right? As I told you before, each autopilot is linked to each FMGC. So if F autopilot one is working, means that FMGC one is working. Then autopilot channel for the autothrust is channel number one. But what happens if I'm using autopilot one with autothrust channel one and this suddenly chain uh, fails? So what happens is that I get this engine thrust lock message on the flight mode annunciator then I try to recover the auto thrust. So the aircraft is helping me keeping the power frozen, the power I had in order not to get power changes that may be not only uncomfortable, but also dangerous for the aircraft operation. And then I try to recover the other auto thrust. So as I told you, if I am flying autopilot one, normally auto thrust is in channel number one but we can fly autopilot one with channel number two of the autothrust in case it fails. How do I change the autothrust channel? It's very easy. Just by depressing the autothrust push button on the FCU and then I'll get the other channel active. And remember that on the backup philosophy of the Airbus, I'll get the same capabilities and the same functions with any channel of the auto thrust okay then that's the procedure itself but it's actually very easy so um thank you for attending to this short jet orientation course in gta uh as you may have seen uh, during this presentation i skipped some things because actually this course is seen more in detail deeply and during GTA presential or online courses. So if you come there or if you perform the course, actually you'll be able to get all the knowledge out of the A320 because if you remember what I said at the beginning of the presentation, actually the Airbus is a very complex aircraft and it requires deep knowledge and a lot of time to explain and to understand all the functions we have available on the aircraft in order to properly and of course safely operate the Airbus 320. So once again, thank you for attending to the presentation and I hope to see you around again. Thank you.